Hi everyone, we're live. It's the second week. Hi everyone, we're live. It's the second week of the Technology for Good Hangout. Uh, welcome if you're just joining. Uh, thanks for taking some time out. I hope to have some interesting stories for you here today. Um, I'm trying a slightly new technical format, so bear with me if there are any glitches. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to bring to your attention, the first story that I wanted to bring to your attention today was uh, this story coming out of the NOAA which said, and this is just by way of setting context, that the planet Earth had its fourth warmest year on record in 2013. Uh, I'll be showing up a couple of stories like this throughout the show. I'll have the links to them in the show notes at the end, so don't worry about uh, trying to catch up with them or keep up. So uh, the Earth had its fourth warmest year on record in 2013. Uh, the average temperatures across the globe was 1.12 degrees above the 20th century average. Uh, the top 10 warmest years on record have occurred since 1998, with the hottest year on record being 2010. So bearing that in mind, we need to have technology working for us to help us counteract what's happening to our planet, reduce our emissions, and basically just um, help get the planet back in order again, uh, or help with the mitigation of the global climate uh, change that's, that is happening. So where to from there? Well, the first thing that I wanted to uh, chat about is a couple of stories that came from the world of cloud computing. And the first story that I saw there was one that was pinged to me by John Reed. And the story is, uh, it, it, it kind of talks to a narrative that um, on the Green Monk website I've been talking about for quite a while, where I, I say that the cloud is not green, or at least if it is green, no one has proven it is yet. No one is publishing data. And the author of this piece, and Alan Peacock, who's a co-founder of a company called Space Monkey, does a very good job in this article of saying why he thinks cloud is not green, uh, consuming a lot of power, and so on and so on. What he fails to do, though, is you know, is to say, what is the answer? He does give an answer, and in his answer, he's pushing Space Monkey uh, as a way of fixing the um, carbon footprint of cloud computing. So this is more like a bit of advertorial on Recode than it is an actual serious article, unfortunately. Uh, really, the answer to um, the carbon footprint of cloud computing is not to do distributed cloud computing, which is Space Monkey's idea. Rather, it is to force utility companies uh, to change their generation away from uh, using fossil fuels and onto using more renewables. And we're seeing some uh, of the large cloud players do this. Google and Facebook, for example, are very strong in pushing uh, their utility partners towards renewables. Um, and more recently, Apple has started to join that, that group as well. Uh, and hopefully, we'll see more and more companies doing that, pressuring their utility companies away from fossil fuels and onto renewables. Another story that came out this uh, last week was a, an interesting story out of uh, TCD, Trinity College Dublin, so a bit of an Irish story here as well. It's a, a combination. A uh, project between IBM Dublin and Trinity College Dublin, where they've come up with a bit of software which can, using distributed cloud computing, check a number of factors for your cloud computing cloud computing load, and then shift your cloud computing load to wherever is cleanest or greenest or cheapest at any particular point in time. Now, this is kind of stuff that I've talked about before on Green Monk, and it's basically called uh, chasing the moon, which is where you send your cloud computing load to where, as I said earlier, it's cheapest and greenest at any point in time. This project has come up with a way of doing that. It's still a project stage. It isn't a commercial product yet. And there's a, a full journal article about it linked at the bottom of the piece. So if I scroll down, you can see at the end of the article, uh, it says a copy of the journal article is available here. And here is underlined. And that is a link to the article. So feel free to click on that and to um, uh, check it out. 
the next story in the cloud computing space that I wanted to mention was about Servergy. And we talked last week in the show about how um, Open Compute uh, have got a lot of partner companies working with them, uh, one of them being ARM, and the ARM architecture for servers is really taking off. Well, this week, Servergy, who are a company also closely associated with Open Compute and who will be addressing, uh, who, who will be uh, presenting at the Open Compute Summit, uh, they've released a press release talking about their new class of clean, green, hyper-efficient servers. And these are very efficient servers which are not on the ARM architecture, rather they're on the power architecture. They're using Power Linux. Uh, uh, so. They, they as well. So if you're looking for clean, green servers, it's well worth checking the ARM server architecture and the power server architecture now being served up by ServerG. So uh, that's the uh, that's the stories in the cloud computing space I wanted to cover this week. Uh, there are also things I wanted to talk about, and I say things because uh, the Internet of Things had a couple of stories this week that I wanted to address. And if we talk about those, we can see that, for example, uh, the the Nest. Nest company, the company that was bought by Google, we talked about them last week. They were bought. Uh, for like three billion, three point two billion dollars, three billion in cash, and Nest has been a very successful organization in selling its um, thermostats and smoke detectors, and has gotten its name out there uh, very, very well. A lot of very positive PR. But the purchase by Google has raised some fears amongst some people uh, that now Google might start using Nest's uh, data, and Nest, of course, has data on when you're at home and not, and this may or may not may or not may or may or may not be something you'd be comfortable Google being aware of. So uh, Tony Fadell, who is the CEO of Nest, has come out this last week and addressed those fears in this article. <clears throat> at the DLD conference in Munich, he came out and said, look, at this point, there are no changes to our uh, terms of use. And if there are any changes to those terms of use, what we'll do is uh, we'll make that transparent and open uh, so that anyone, uh, so that everyone becomes aware of it, even when it happens. And also that uh, it'll be opt out, not automatically opt in, but opt out. So that all sounds good as long as, uh, I guess, Tony stays on as CEO, <laughs> or that that particular uh, piece of information, that, that those particular policies aren't changed at some future point in time. We talked as well about some of the companies involved in the Internet of Things, and another company that I became aware of this week is this company, who are called Connect Sense. Uh, someone sent me a release about them this week. I hadn't heard of them before. I had a look. They have some sensors in the temperature and humidity space, the water space, so for f for detecting floods and things like that, motion detectors, security detectors. The security ones are ones you put on doors and windows, and they tell you if the doors and windows have been opened. And then they've got sirens and strobes as well. So they cover a lot of ground. They don't, however, cover lighting. They don't cover heat. So a lot of the energy efficiency stuff not being part of this. And one disappointing thing, uh, I think, about the um, Connect Sense sensors is they're still quite expensive. Uh, they come in somewhere between $150 and $200 a piece. So they're not exactly cheap. They do connect to Wi-Fi, and they are remotely accessible. So that's good. but. Mm, you know, at that kind of price point, you know, I don't know really how many of them I'm going to rush out and buy, for example. So that's the uh, Internet of Things news for this week. Uh, a new thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, dematerialization. And let me just get that up on the screen here. Whoops. Yeah. Bear with me, as I said. It's the uh, new tech I'm, I'm running this week and uh, <laughs> haven't quite got it all worked out. Dematerialization, yes. So some stories in the dematerialization space that I came across. Well, the first one uh, talks about um, how, sorry, here we go, talks about a new tipping point in e-commerce <clears throat> and how over the Christmas period, we've seen uh, a huge shift away from bricks and mortar stores to 
uh, online purchasing. And I, I saw it myself. I know I did a lot of my own Christmas shopping online this year. Well, some of the numbers out uh, from the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau come from uh, figures from 2012, but you can see the online share of retail sales by category there flying up. And the, the main category, not surprisingly, media, sporting, and hobby goods, uh, followed by electronic and appliance sales. And then you have uh, furniture and clothing coming up next. So they're really flying up. Everyone is seeming to move more and more towards them. The ones at the bottom there are health and personal care. I got to think that's getting a bit of a bump from the wear wearables that are coming out, and food and beverage is still uh, staying quite low. Uh, not really surprising there as yet. There's not a huge amount to move towards uh, food and beverage online just because of the time it takes to deliver. But the the the, the numbers are staggering because it says, the U.S. Census Bureau says that the four specialty retail categories, uh, their total sales grew only $5 billion between 2007 and 2011, which is the, the latest date, uh, whereas the e-commerce players increased sales in these categories by $35 billion over the time period, which means the cumulative sales for brick and mortars shrank by $30 billion in just four years. It's a really interesting piece. Click on the link in the show notes afterwards. Look at this uh, story. It's, a, it's an interesting story. Other stories in this space, um, Paramount announced uh, during the week that they're shifting away from film-based movies to digital only now for their U.S. releases. Their Oscar-nominated film, The Wolf of Wall Street, is going to be the first movie in wide release to be distributed in digital format only. Um, this, I guess, could be seen as a good thing uh, in that, you know, we're moving away from uh, physical to more digital releases. Um, so you, you got to think there's a, you know, carbon footprint saving there. The downside of this, I guess, is for cinemas that don't have digital projectors, they either have to go and make the investment in dig digital projectors now, which are not cheap, or they got to go out of business. There is no real alternative, so it's it's a tricky one. Um, it's it, but it's 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 a shift. It's a change in the times. Everything is moving from hardware to software, and we see this as well in in the server space. Uh, IBM has sold its x86 server unit to Lenovo for 2.3 billion, which is you know a lot of people were saying it's it's a cheap price to get for it. Uh, this article on Bloomberg talks about it, and I know it's a it's a part of IBM that IBM have been trying to uh, sell for quite some time. Uh, there was an aborted sales attempt of this group last year uh, to Lenovo, but it fell through. They couldn't agree on a price, uh, but. This week, they managed to agree on a price, $2.3 billion, as IBM moves away from hardware again. You'll remember they sold their desktop and laptop arm to Lenovo a few years back. And finally, in this dematerialization space, we see TiVo also laying off most of its design team as it transitions to the, to the cloud. I nearly said to the cloud. To the cloud. So again, a move away from hardware and to services. So those are the stories in the dematerialization space that we've seen during the week. Um, the next section that I was going to talk about was the electric vehicles. And the electric vehicles uh, space had some good news this week as well, as we saw um, that, uh, wait, sorry, turn this off. We saw that um, the Nissan company announced that they had sold their 100,000th Nissan LEAF. The Nissan LEAF is the company's all-electric car. It's not a hybrid. It's fully battery electric. And as I said, Nissan announced they've sold their 100,000th of them. So kudos to them. Great success for them. Uh, the other big seller in the all-electric space would be the Tesla, the Model S, and the Roadster. Uh, the Model S is in a different category, obviously, to the Leaf. The Leaf is kind of your family car. Uh, it's a small size car, uh, small to medium, whereas the uh, Tesla Model S is a coupe, much higher end car. Uh, and other news in this space as well, speaking of uh, lower end, the Smart Company, uh, who are owned by Mercedes, uh, 
they have announced an electric bike. They've announced this for quite a while. Uh, 2011, I think, was when they first announced it. But uh, they, they showed the concept in 2011. But at the uh, Detroit Auto Show in this last week, they've actually brought it out. They've, they've shown the actual uh, bike. And it seems to be a fascinating looking uh, bike, very well uh, sculpted and developed. The bike uh, goes up to 25 kilometers an hour, if I remember correctly. It's got an LED headlight. It's got a, a special holder on the handlebars for holding your smartphone. So you can have uh, inbuilt smartphone. It's got regenerative braking. So as you brake, it recharges the battery. The battery is in the back wheel. Or sorry, the, the motor is in the back wheel. Uh, it, it's a pedal electric. So the, the, as you pedal, it adds power to your pedal, to your pedaling, makes you go faster. Um, it's got uh, disc brakes. It's got a, unusually for a bike, it's got a carbon uh, toothed, chain, not a, not a metal chain, so you don't need to worry, and there's no mudguard there, you don't need to worry about your clothes getting dirty uh, from the chain, at least, because there's no oil on this, it's carbon fiber, so, and it's toothed there, so that's an interesting development. And the battery, the battery on this bike, uh, you can see it just here on screen now, that battery is a pull-out battery. You can pull it out, bring it to your office with you, plug it into the wall, and it recharges. And the battery is good for, I've forgotten how long, but you know, unless you're doing like 30 or 40 miles on the bike a day, you're fully covered by this bike. OK, that's that space. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to talk about on the show was uh, platforms. And we have a small bit of news about platforms, not too much, just one little story there. Uh, but we'll move over to that now. And the platform news we have, if I just put it up on the screen here, is a Kickstarter. Um, it, it, it's kind of a, it's a Kickstarter play. It's kind of a, a mixture of a wearables story and a platform story. Uh, the story the story revolves around this company called Avigant, who have brought out this uh, Avigant Glyph device. And you can see here, it looks kind of like a pair of headphones, which is what it is. But as well as being headphones, as you can see in this uh, video uh, screenshot here, you can swing the headphone head part down, and it becomes a screen in front of your eyes. In fact, it's not a screen. It's a, it is a screen and it's not a screen. It, it doesn't have an inbuilt screen. What it has is a couple of thousand mirrors, no, a couple of million mirrors, two million tiny micro mirrors, they call them. Uh, and they have this, uh, it's called a virtual retinal display. So they project images using these mirrors directly onto your retina. And apparently it's supposed to create a much sharper image than any screen that you would have in front of your eyes. So. This is a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, they've blown past their target. They wanted to get a, a 250,000 was their goal. Uh, they've gotten, so far, they've gotten over 580,000, so well past that. Uh, pledging $499, I think, guarantees you delivery of the first one of these when they're introduced. Uh, they've filled that now. But why did I say it's a platform? Well, it's a platform play as well because uh, they're opening the API of this up as well, so people will be able to uh, hack it and use it for games development. Uh, so you can imagine having your uh, smartphone in front of you with a game on it connected to these uh, headphones, and instead of playing the smartphone uh, game on your phone screen, or your tablet screen, you can now have it projected directly onto your eyes using this Avigant glyph. So it, uh, it looks like a significant step forward in the wearable space, but also they've been clever enough to realize that it's the developers, as we always say in Redmonk, it's the developers who push the agenda. So they're appealing to the developers by opening up the APIs, <clears throat> and uh, it's now uh, up to developers to develop whatever applications for this particular device. OK, so the final section in the show today is going to be the miscellaneous features and uh, miscellaneous stories that I've come across during the week. And the uh, first one of those I want to talk about is uh, got an Irish angle to it as well. It's uh, a payment company called Stripe. 
and <clears throat> Stripe again. Nice little segue here, as well as being Irish, Stripe as well have targeted the developers because, again, they know it's the developers who are the real kingmakers, as my colleague Stephen O'Grady likes to say. Um, Stripe are a payments company. Uh, so they help developers develop the payment systems for e-commerce applications. They're a back-end company. Uh, they've just landed a new round of funding. They've landed 80 million from VC investors like Koshla Ventures, Sequoia Capital, and Founders Fund. It's run by two Irish brothers, John and Patrick Collison. Uh, they've now their company now is uh, valued, according to this, at uh, 1.75 billion dollars US which is a pretty high price and you know when you hear of companies like Instagram selling for a billion dollars and a uh, snapchat uh, turning down an offer valuing it at 3 billion uh, something like this at 1.75 billion you kind of go yeah that's just the kind of balloon effect Tom we've got a bubble going on here but you know not really because stripe is actually a company which is taking in money and which is um, helping companies make money as well. It's a really impressive company. Uh, if you look at some of the numbers they have there, uh, the, I mean, their, their, their competitors are people like Lyft and PayPal, uh, but they've now um, they've they're hitting into this section. They've targeted um, the, the mobile sector in particular uh, for mobile payments, which is a which is a a, a market which is opening up enormously. Um, they've raised now 120 million from developers, or sorry, from investors, who include people like Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, and Andreessen uh, Hor Horowitz. So, uh, an interesting story there, and I think one that you, that's well worth looking into. Into. Uh, they're also apparently in talks with Twitter uh, to see if they can uh, roll out, help Twitter roll out a shopping feature. So interesting there. The second last story of today is a story about consumer grade hard drives. Uh, and this comes out of the Backblaze blog. And if you're not familiar with Black, <laughs> I knew I was going to get in trouble trying to say that. If you're not familiar with Backblaze, uh, they're a company which do online backups. I, I use them myself, and they're they're extremely good. Uh, they, they just run in the background on your computer, and they send all their stuff to their offline servers. So while, while everything I have is backed up here locally onto external hard drives, it's also backed up uh, remotely to the Backblaze hard drives. So Backblaze have been in business uh, three or four years now, uh, and as you can imagine, they know uh, disk drives because they use a crap load of them to house all the data that they keep for, uh, for everyone whose backups they maintain. So uh, you can see in the article there, as of the end of 2013, they had 27,134 consumer-grade hard drives spinning in their storage pods. And they give a breakdown of all the numbers there. And they, the, the main uh, hard drives that they have are Hitachi, Western Digital, and Seagate. And they go into a lot of detail in this post uh, about those hard drives, and they talk about uh, the numbers they have, how many terabytes they've stored, the age of them, they talk about their annual failure rates uh, across drives and across uh, sizes of drives as well. Uh, they talk about how much information, the number of individual drives, the age and years, and the annual failure rate, it's all broken out into lots of uh, different charts and graphs there. The bottom line, the bottom takeaway from this is that of those consumer grade drives, the Hitachis come out best uh, from the 36 month survival rate graph they've got there. You can see that Hitachi drives are at 96.9%, uh, Western Digital are at 94%, and Seagate are down at 73%. So if you're thinking of investing in consumer grade hard drives, you, you wouldn't want to be looking at Seagate, you'd be looking more at Western Digital and Hitachi. So, final story for today. Uh, Google are launching a new video quality report to evaluate the internet service provider's network performance. Uh, 